Think not the Lord came to peace this earth. He came to give us a sword. Shalom in the name of the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Time of Night Watchmen. Time of Night Watchmen. Commentary, information, Bible, prophecy, and stuff. Woo! So we're going to be covering some <clears throat> some things prophetic. I, I was given two questions yesterday prior to a uh, fellowship with some people from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, I've I got to admit, I get along with these people. <clears throat> Not unlike the people in the Messianic Church. And they have some commonality there, and we'll get into that as well, too. But uh, the subject matter today essentially is, for whom has changed times and laws, Daniel 7.25, and pertain to the dream I had about the upcoming events, is who are the two black horsemen? Some of you who have been with me for quite a long time, you can always look back at some of my videos pertain to the black horsemen. Uh, we'll be addressing that as an issue too, because that's the two questions essentially that came up in what we would call a midrash uh, in the fellowship we had yesterday. So it was really, really great, intense. Uh, <clears throat> going into the, um, the Daniel 7.25 prophecy, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and share wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. It says, They shall be given into his hand until time and times in the body of time. So some, some scholars have said it's just a matter of days or, or years. So that's like 1,300 some odd years, like that, 1,700 years. Anyway, so needless to say, we're not focusing on the time span, but the fact that Antichrist has a tendency of wanting to change times and laws. So we're going to look at it. That's, that's the key subject matter. The other part would briefly, uh, a slight insight, possibly, pertaining to that dream, pertaining to my two black horsemen dream. And we'll get into that very shortly. So, again, anytime we talk about prophecy, we, we go to 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says... For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. The, the key point to this is we see prophecy kind of like, in, like looking through a dark mirror. We don't know until we actually come face to face with it. Fortunately, in this time period, we have come face to face. And we have a really good examination of what time we're in. It's as I've said before, we are in a time of Jacob's trouble. But neither here nor there, let's, let's continue to focus on the, the points that are not just uh, uh, past, but there are those things that are up and coming. <clears throat> we know, of course, there is a sign in the heaven coming up in 2024. There will be an Aleph displayed of all things over the United States of America. This is a solar eclipse. We talked about this before. This will be in 2024, the final phase of that crossing. Interesting enough, uh, I suspect we're going to see a lot of things after that. So, if anything, all things begin there. Huh. If you keep track of the times and times, so it would be a time of Jacob's trouble. You know, a time of Jacob's trouble has three sevens. The first seven years, second seven years, and essentially the five, seventh year, seven years. So, <clears throat> keep that in mind as this comes up in 2024. Because, you know, there's other things coming, which is really interesting. We have another Tetrad coming up. And this will be in 2033, has been brought to my attention. And I want you to make a special note here. These events, signs, are occurring on the Lord's feast days. These are not Jewish feasts, folks. Nope. These are the Lord's feast. Now, and we're, we're going to talk a little, a little, if not a lot, about that very topic in the midst of this. <clears throat> T-O-T-K. So just keep that in mind. We have this tetra coming up in 2033 as well, too. If you know anything about Matthew 24, about the signs of heavens and the and the moon's turn to blood and sun into scarlet, then we got some really, like I said, just amazing some of the things we're looking at right now. So let, let's look at St. Who, who is St. Gregory? Yeah, let's go there. What do you think? Okay. See about Antichrist. So the Gregorian calendar is the calendar used in most parts of the world. It was in, introduced in February 24th with a pop-up bull and went into effect in October 8, 1582 by Pope Gregory the 13th as a modification of and replacement for the Julian calendar. Hmm. The principal change was to space leap years differently so as to make the average calendar year 365.2425 days long more closely approximately to 365.2422 days. <laughs> Tropical or solar. 
year that is determined by the Earth's revolution around the sun. So essentially, it is a solar calendar. Okay. Now, so who is St. Gregory? Well, clearly, he's a pope. All right, that should already wave signs already, like, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, who's this guy? This is very important to remember this, or realize this. This guy is essentially Antichrist. Yeah, we're back to Daniel 725. He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Mm -hmm. So what was God's intention from the beginning of his creation, and how are we supposed to address times and his laws? You read a lot quiet in Genesis chapter 1 about the signs in the heavens, the moons, the stars, and of course the sun. So it's all inclusive, not exclusive. So is it just a solar calendar or is there something more to it? See, a lot of it, we, we follow the footsteps of our elders because we believe they know the truth. Therefore, we don't search it out for ourselves, and which is a common mistake for most of us. We just go along to get along, only to find out later on and say, wait a minute, something's going wrong. I think I've been conned or misled. So, Antichrist. So, hmm, St. Gregory, Antichrist. What's really, again, what's really interesting is the Messianic, as well as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, the Messianic movement, I, I call it also the uh, Hebrew Roots, Jews for Jesus, uh, Torah observers, so on and so forth. The commonality between all these, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is the Sabbath Keepers. Those who believe it's Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown, or Saturday, okay, here's another one, but not Sunday. Okay, these are your Sabbath keepers, not people who do not follow the Sunday law, which some people call also the blue law, uh, because it is an understand and recognized from this group of people as Antichrist, which leads to the question, and we shall perpetuate that question, is, wait, 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 who's St. Gregory then? Do we worship St. Gregory and his new calendar? It's kind of new. I mean, look in 1500s. That's what? The, well, 500 years ago only. Julian, of course, goes further back than that. And Julian. Julius Caesar Julian. Hmm. Oh, yeah. He was a pro-Christian, wasn't he? <laughs> Say that in jest. Obviously not. Another Antichrist. So, again, let's, let's go on. So, in these two groups of people, generally speaking... They believe this, they are Sabbath keepers, and I, I guess that's why I get along with them so well, because they do recognize there is a Sabbath. God has appointed a time that is holy, a day to reconciliation, a day to rest. And as Jesus once taught me, as according to the scriptures or epistles, or as well as the gospel, is that do good things. It makes for a good mishmash that in itself. So we're just keep that in mind. So when it comes to the Mexican movement and the Seventh-day Adventists, they, they, they pretty much coincide for keeping the sabbath day holy but you know going back to antichrist i think one of the big uh, predators of christianity was a guy named constantine oh wait wait no not that constantine this constantine that's it <clears throat> constantine essentially was the emperor of rome who basically and essentially started the roman catholic church that's basically the precursor I know the Romans of Romans, Roman Catholics, they all say, oh, Peter was the first. No, he was. Come on, let's let's be serious. But, you know, it's it's propaganda. They, they spew out all the time. It's kind of like the Joseph Goebbels thing. You say a lie long enough or loud enough, people start believing the truth. But they don't look into it for themselves. Hmm. We don't want to get into that habit. We should question everything and research things for ourselves. Because, you know, I don't have all the answers, but... You know, I do have a brain God has given me. I tend to think a lot of times out of the box, and I tend to question. So I question the legitimacy of Friday Sabbath to Saturday Sabbath based on what I'm reading right now. Hmm, Constantine. That's like 325, 311 in that time period was Constantine made Rome Christian. Well, at least his kind of Christian. Who clearly is obtaining that of a solar calendar, not a loony solar calendar. There's also something else you want to look in your research, a thing called Hillel 2, which basically coincided with the change in times and laws. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit. What's also interesting, what kind of almost coincides with something we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. <clears throat> Who were the Nicolaitans? See, I find I find things kind of fall into place. 
It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical place. It could also be a spiritual thing as well, too. And let's look a little bit about the Nicolaitans, because I think this kind of summarizes who and what the Roman Catholic Church really is. So let's read here. This comes from Wikipedia. The Nicolaitans were an early Christian sect, hmm, mentioned twice in the book of Revelation of the New Testament. They were called Nicolaitans, Nicolaitanes, or Nicolites, and were considered heretical by the mainstream early Christian church. Hmm. The exact origin of the Nicolaitans is unclear, but some Bible commentators believe they were a heretical sect who followed the teachings of Nicholas. Huh. Like St. Nicholas? I wonder? Hmm. Anyway, who was possibly one of the deacons of the early church mentioned in Acts 6.5. Arrhenius said that they were followers of Nicolaus of Antioch, a proselyte who was among the seven men chosen to serve in the Jerusalem congregation who had forsaken true Christian doctrine and lived in unrestrained indulgence. Denoted in this picture here. Unrestrained indulgence. <laughs> I don't know, it just seems kind of interesting coincidence, or as we say, quinky dink here. So maybe we should learn more about these Nicolaitans. All right, so here in the book of Revelation, this is chapter 2, it says, Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, for whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of the, his place, except thou repent. In case you don't understand, a candlestick that actually is the Spirit of God. But this thou hast, thou, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So the Lord hates these people yeah, and peoples. So much though, they are not, have a chapter of their own in the book of Revelation. Hmm. Makes you kind of wonder that. Interesting enough, too, in regards to these doctrines of dogma, it's uh, this greasy grace we hear about all the time that anything goes mentality which in and of itself is Antichrist, or sons and daughters of perdition, I tend to say from time to time. So this is just one part of the book in Revelation chapter 2. We talk about the Nicolaitans. Uh, let's see what else it says. Uh, on to verse 13. It says, I know thy works, and when thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. Ouch. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Hmm. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, you know, idolatry stuff, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Hmm. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Yes, folks, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but God does hate things, and this happens to be one of them. So, interesting. The seat of Satan. And if you don't know what that is in the image there, that's actually the, the papacy seat. Yeah, in Rome. <laughs> we see where I'm getting at here. So it's like, so we're, we're attached to the Gregorian calendar. Why? Don't worry, there's an out. We just got to think it through, okay, or work it out, as we say, or... Midrash or to Yisrael to wrestle with God and his word. So that's a little more input on Nicolaitans. So again, we, we go for whom has changed times and laws. Clearly the Gregorian calendar is not the calendar God had intended us to follow. Are you there with me? Gregorian, as in Gregory, as in Pope, who changed the times and laws. Uh, maybe I'm the only one who's a, a, a acquiring this kind of affiliation and critical thinking and realize that it's wrong. It's a solar calendar. Hmm. It's wrong. But we've been brought up to think this way, and it's hard to change, even to renewing your mind, which requires a relationship we have with God. And God has renewed my mind quite a while ago, and, 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 and I, I, I understand this. I, I follow this. I observe this. So we kind of know who changed times and laws. It's interesting. Nicolaitans are clearly seem to be corresponding for the Roman Catholic Church, and it's no surprise. Look, look at their history. It's not Christian. It's anything but Christian. But, of course, the new moon. I mean, let's talk about the new moon. There's, there's so many... 
I mean, there's a lot of scripture, Old Testament and New. Even in a negative point of view, because people did, they they did a religion, but they didn't have a relationship. You can find those in, in a lot of your uh, scriptures pertaining to, in the Haftorah, if you will, about uh, God was not pleased, even the fact they were doing what they're supposed to do, despite the fact they didn't seek a relationship with God. Look, for example, Ezra 3, 5, a positive. And after it offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of everyone that willingly offer a free will offering unto the Lord. Hmm, that's just an Ezra. In Psalms 81, 81 3, it says, Blow up the trumpet in the new moon, in time appointed on our solemn feast day. Wow. How about Colossians? I guess you didn't think it go that, that recent. Colossians 2, 16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of the holy day or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Wow. Do you, do you not see that? I mean, I don't know how many times both Messianics, Seventh-day Adventists, all these Sabbath keepers, if you will, are constantly being scrutinized or judged for doing the very things God tells us to do, including eating meat. Now, that doesn't mean swine and the unclean food. So this is what the intention and the motivation of the scripture is. Now, some people have gone too far. Personally, they've gone vegetarian. That's your choice. And even Daniel had a little bit of that for a little while. But I've learned a long time ago, meat is a, necess a necessity in my diet. and helps to fight against demonic forces. That's my take on it. That's my understanding. You might not be into the battle part of it. I clearly am, or I wouldn't be the night watchman. So this is all, just just some, my some, not a lot, not a lot, some. And we'll get some more here real soon about the new moon. For example, the seven feasts of, and Sabbaths, Leviticus 23, 2. All of Leviticus 23 says, it says, to speak of the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, it's the feast, not the Jewish feast, the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be a holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. God responds. I have these feasts clearly shown here on this clip. Seven feasts of Lord and or plus his Sabbaths. Another thing, what so forever what does forever mean? Here, I love this one. This I, I get this all the time. I, I hear that well the, the laws of, of God are for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, you're putting us back under the law? It's like, you talk about people who don't study to show themselves approved by God. I guess that's why I enjoy the Messianics and the Seventh-day Adventists, because they actually study. <laughs> you always get a good midrash going on with these people, because they actually study. Not like the satanic ones out here that call themselves Christians, but I guess they're Nicolaitans as well, too. So let's start off a bit at a time. The word forever. What does forever mean? The last time I checked, it means forever. <laughs> anyway, it says, in Leviticus 23, 14, it says, And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute. You ready? Forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Just one of them. Leviticus 23, 21. You can always look these up for yourself. It's basically all of chapter 23 of Leviticus. There are other corresponding chapters to this chapter, but I can do Deuteronomy and such. Leviticus 23, 21. It says, And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute. Oh, there's that word again. Forever. All your dwellings throughout your generations. I got Leviticus 23, 21 up here twice, it looks like. I guess it was very important. I guess I'll read it again. He shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever <laughs> in all your dwellings throughout your generations. I call this like a, going on a date with God. That's, that's probably the most easy explanation what these all are about. Leviticus 23, 31 says, You shall do no manner of works. It shall be a statute uh, <laughs> forever. 
Throughout your generations, all your dwellings. <laughs> do you, do, do you, are you getting the point here? Uh, 2341, and you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. But apparently to some people, forever means until Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> so, I, but I don't see that in this wording here. Until Jesus comes, it's up until Jesus comes. But I don't see that. I see forever. Do you, do you see the hypocrisy here that you get from Christendom these days, or churchianity, fluffyanity? Forever, forever. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of. Let's move on. All right. So, are there any questions about forever and the feast days and the Sabbath days and? Hmm. Interesting. Yes. The new moon. So what's so important about following after God's laws and God's commandments, God's calendar? Signs. Signs, folks. Signs of the coming of the Lord. Signs in preparing ourselves for his kingdom here on earth. Signs. All corresponding to his laws and his commandments. The new moon as well as the full moon. I mean, it's 14 days from the new moon to the full moon. Two times seven, or a seven is a Sabbath. Right? The seventh day is the Sabbath day. Again, we're not talking about the boring calendar anymore. We're talking about the loony solar calendar at this point. Prophecy. It aligns itself prophetically with the events here and now and yet to come. Whereas Antichrist has purposely changed times and laws. And we have forgot the basic, basic understanding, the as a matter of fact portion of our walk, that these are the things God has made and these are those who have perverted and had changed times and laws. Is Gregory, Gregorian, is he your God? Or is it the Almighty God through Jesus Christ? Antichrist is quite profound if you look at the world today. The things that make you go, hmm, right? The things that make you go, hmm. We have Rosh Hashanah coming up, folks. It's September 15th, 17th, the new moon. It's coming up. Keep your eyes looking up. Which leads us here. To the, big, the second question is, who are the two black horsemen in my dream? Who are riding to and fro, warning of a coming tsunami. The blatant straight word I got the other day was, these are his two witnesses. You think? Two black horsemen. His two witnesses. Hmm. It could be. But again, we are still looking through glass darkly, only seeing a part to become face to face. So, and I've been looking even in the, the Christian circles, uh, the secular circles, and the, the off secular, if you will, and I have not seen these two folks of any kind professing of a coming tsunami yet. You have two witnesses in Revelation 11, 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy in 1,203 score days. Clothe and sackcloth. Days could be days. It could be years. I've always believed there's always been two witnesses in every generation. This one is no exception to the rule. So keep that in mind. The two black horsemen could be the two witnesses. That's basically the one of the final parts of the question I got answered as I asked. But the main thing is, why do we still conform to this world when the world we know is coming to an excruciating end, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Look up, folks. The kingdom of God is at hand. Perhaps it's time to change or unchange our thinking about when the Sabbath is and start preparing for a new calendar, which is not so new. It's very old. It is God's. 
calendar. Anyway, food for thought. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. You know, this is Time of the Night Watchman. Time of the Night Watch time. Commentary, information, Bible prophecy stuff. See ya. Don't want to be ya. And remember, there's only one way, one truth, and one life. In Jesus' name, amen.